Hey everyone, today we are looking into Françoise Daubigny, a member of the lesser nobility in France who would go on to become the lover of the French king, Louis XIV. Eventually the pair married, but despite this, their union was kept hidden. But why, and who exactly was the uncrowned Queen of France? Françoise Daubigny was born on the 27th of November 1635 in the town of Niort in western France. Her father was Constant d'Aubigny, a member of the minor nobility in 17th century France, while her mother was Jeanne de Cardillac. Constant had ended up in Niort owing to his religious dissension. He was a Huguenot or French Protestant and had been imprisoned in Niort by Cardinal Richelieu, the chief minister of King Louis XIII, as a result of his religious beliefs. Here he met Jeanne, the daughter of his jailer, and sometime later, Françoise was conceived. Thus, Françoise's early years were spent growing up in the slightly unusual situation of her father being held in a prison which was run by her maternal grandfather. Constant was released in 1645 when Françoise was 10 years old. They left soon after for the West Indies in the Caribbean, where Constant had been assured that he was to be appointed as governor of the small island of Marie Galant. However, when they arrived there they discovered that this was misinformation. Eventually, the family returned to France where Francois' father died in 1647. Thereafter, Francoise was raised in a strict Catholic manner until her mother, curiously an ardent Catholic in contrast to her father, died as well in 1651. Françoise subsequently became the charge of Madame de Noyant, whose daughter was Françoise's godmother. However, Madame de Noyant was anxious to rid herself of her new ward, and she was soon sent to live in the house of Paul Scarron, a well-known French poet and author of the time who was crippled. Françoise married him months later, despite a 25-year age gap, stating that she would prefer to marry Scarron rather than enter a convent. As Scarron's wife, she presided over his literary salon in the years that followed. The marriage was quite unconventional, and some have even speculated that it was never actually consummated. In any case, there was a loyalty between them, and Françoise remained as Paul's nurse as his health deteriorated prior to his eventual death in 1660, nine years after their marriage. Thus, in 1660, Françoise found herself a widow, having only just turned 25 years of age. She was also childless, and given her attractive looks, was initially tempted to become a courtesan. However, other options were available to her. As the host of Scarron's literary salon, she had come into contact with some of the most prominent individuals in French society of the mid-17th century. These extended all the way to the court, where Anne of Austria, the mother of King Louis XIV, had agreed to provide her with an annual allowance of 2,000 livres, a very considerable sum of money for the time, and one on which Françoise could live in reasonable comfort even without remarrying. As a result, she spent much of the 1660s continuing her work in the literary society of Paris and France. Things changed, however, in 1666. The Queen Mother died that year, and the King, with whom Françoise had no relationship at this stage, suspended the payment. In financial straits, Françoise accepted an offer shortly afterwards from Françoise Athenaï de Rochechouart, the Marquise de Montespan, one of the King's mistresses, to visit the court. There, she quickly acquired a position. Though Louis XIV, was married to Queen Maria Theresa, he had many mistresses and would eventually sire seven illegitimate children along with Montespan. When one of these was born in 1669, the Marquise placed the child with Françoise in Paris and provided her with a salary and some servants to undertake this work. The situation continued for many years to come. Louis XIV, in recognition of Françoise's work in raising his illegitimate child, provided her with a payment of 200,000 livres, 
with which she bought an estate at Maintenon. Later, he awarded her the title of Marquise de Maintenon, in recognition of her large land holding here and her service to the crown. It is not wholly clear when Francois's relationship with the king became more than one between ruler and servant. Louis XIV was the most powerful monarch in 17th century Europe. He succeeded his father Louis XIII as King of France when he was just four years of age in 1643. Consequently, he did not begin to rule France in his own right until 1661, but when he did, he showed a steely determination to rule by decree and through the divine right of kings, which has led him to be appraised as the epitome of monarchical absolutism in early modern Europe. As part of this, he had ordered the construction of a vast new royal palace and court at Versailles, some 20 kilometers outside of Paris. Here Louis imagined that he would rule France in a more distant aloof fashion than his predecessors, who had stationed themselves in the center of the French capital. It was here at Versailles that Francois and Louis's relationship would blossom, perhaps as early as 1673, but it was clearly ongoing by 1678. By the early 1680s, she was chief among his mistresses and had replaced the Marquis de Montespan in the king's affections. Louis seems to have been charmed by a woman who was able to converse substantially with him on a wide range of matters, including politics, economics, and French literature. What substantially altered the situation in 1683 was the death of Louis's long-suffering wife, Queen Maria Theresa, on the 30th of July, owing to complications arising from an abscess on her arm. The death of the Queen now opened up the possibility for Louis remarrying, yet in an unusual decision the King of France determined to wed his mistress, but not in an official capacity. Shortly after the old Queen's death, the King and Francoise were married in a private ceremony officiated by the Archbishop of Paris, Francois de Harlay de Champvaillon. It is generally believed to have occurred on the 9th of October 1683, though others have suggested the secret nuptials were actually carried out in January 1684. The ceremony was attended by a small group of individuals, including the King's confessor and a handful of court officials. Consequently, the number of individuals who actually witnessed the ceremony was limited, and details of the clandestine wedding were few and far between today. What is clear is that sometime in the autumn of 1683, or the winter that followed, Françoise d'Aubigny, the Marquise of Maintenon, became the Queen of France, a queen that almost nobody knew was the king's new wife. Various explanations have been put forward as to why the marriage was kept secret. Some have suggested that the fact that the couple had been involved in an affair prior to the death of Queen Maria Theresa could have created a public scandal, but the real reason was most likely that Francois's inferior social status did not make it acceptable according to the royal conventions of the time for them to acknowledge the marriage in public. A king of Louis' stature was expected to marry somebody of royal blood from one of the other monarchical families of Europe. Francois did not meet this requirement, and so a decision was taken to not acknowledge the marriage to the wider realm. It would quite probably have been clear to all with eyes what the new arrangement was at Versailles. Here, as with other royal palaces in the early modern period, the king and queen would have had separate apartments to themselves, but Francoise was soon installed in the apartments which were at the top of the grand staircase at Versailles, facing directly opposite those of the king. With this, contemporaries noted that thereafter, he always spent some significant part of the day with Francoise. Given this, as well as her intelligence and education, it begs the question, to what extent did France's secret queen impact French politics and society? The new queen's political influence and impact on French society in the years that followed has been a matter of some considerable debate. She was criticised extensively by Protestant authors who believed that she had some role in Louis' decision 
to recommence the persecution of French Protestants in 1685, with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had granted freedom of religion to all French people for much of the 17th century. However, there is no evidence to suggest that Françoise was in any way responsible for her new husband's decision, and it is purely circumstantial that Louis took this harsh measure shortly after his secret wedding to his second wife. Indeed, recent research has suggested just the direct opposite, and that the secret queen was a strong opponent of some of the worst types of persecution of France's Protestants, which occurred in the years that followed. In reality, Françoise's influence was not extensive for the first seven years of her reign as queen. A change occurred in 1700 when the War of Spanish Succession began to erupt across Europe, and it is generally understood that Louis began to rely to a much greater extent on his wife to provide him with advice. Eventually the major conflict which pitted France and Spain against a broad coalition of European powers, led by Britain, Austria and the Dutch Republic, would drag on until 1714. Throughout it, Françoise is generally believed to have been an unofficial government minister to her husband. One of the most significant aspects of Françoise's time as queen was her patronage of women's education. She established the Maison Royale de Saint-Louis at Saint-Cyr in Paris. Here, young French women from impoverished noble families were provided with an education, one which was not solely rooted in a strict Catholicism, as so many schools for the aristocracy were, but in which such women would be provided with a literary and social education as well. The school was extensive, and could provide for 250 students when it was finally finished. Dozens of teachers taught arithmetic, geometry, reading, writing, geography and history, amongst other subjects. Leisure time was also deemed to be of a considerable significance in cultivating a sophisticated mindset for future members of the French nobility, and the students were encouraged to play chess and checkers and other fashionable pursuits of the time. Françoise would eventually reign as a secret queen of France for 32 years. Louis XIV only eventually died on the 1st of September 1715, making his reign of 72 years and 110 days, the longest reign of any European monarch in history. Curiously, despite their long marriage, the pair never had children, Françoise having already been in her late 40s by the time of their marriage, and no children had resulted from the earlier affair, stretching back into the 1670s. Following her husband's death, he was succeeded by his great-grandson as the Sun King had outlived his immediate legitimate male heirs. Louis XV granted Françoise an extensive pension and she retired to Saint-Cyr where she continued to host some of the most distinguished literary and political figures of the age, notably Tsar Peter the Great of Russia on one of his famous trips through Central and Western Europe in his efforts to modernise Russia. Françoise died on the 15th of April 1719. She was 83 years of age. Having never been affirmed to be the Queen of France, she was not given a state funeral or interred in the royal tomb, but rather was buried according to her wishes on the grounds of the school she had established at Saint Cyr. Her extensive estate at Maintenon was bequeathed to her niece, the Duchess of Noailles. Owing to the peculiar marital arrangement between her and Louis XIV, she has been well noted by several writers and has appeared in works by Alexandre Dumas, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Arthur Conan Doyle. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Françoise Daubigny, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did be sure to leave me a like and a comment down below. If you're new and you enjoyed the content, it'd mean a lot if you could subscribe, and also if you guys have notifications turned on, it also means a lot, so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. If you have any suggestions, be sure to also leave them in the comments, or you can send them to my Instagram and email which are both in the description. And anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.